Today I'm going to be speaking about respiratory physiology, CPAP and ventilation for absolutely no reason at all and it's not in any way related to the current events. Respiratory physiology is all about ventilation, that is the movement of air in and out of the lungs, and perfusion, the flow of blood around the lungs, and matching the two so that you get good gas exchange. Now, the first thing I'm therefore going to talk about is ventilation perfusion ratio. Q is the symbol for flow rate in physics, so the ventilation perfusion ratio is also called the VQ ratio, and you can divide the lungs into three zones based on the VQ ratio. Alveoli are elastic, so they're basically like balloons. Now, I'd love to use a balloon to represent an alveolus, but for some reason the shops are out of balloons and they're not selling them, and I don't know why. Anyway, luckily I've got a glove from when I had norovirus a couple of weeks ago and needed something to clean up my vomit, so I'll be using this. Zone 1 is when the VQ ratio is above 1, i.e. you've got more ventilation than perfusion. The alveoli are overinflated and are therefore squishing the vessels, and as you can see from this, the tap flow is uh, being squished by the glove. Zone 2 is when you, the alveoli is deflated a bit so that the alveolar pressure is below the arterial pressure. Now you do have blood flow around the alveoli and you are getting a good VQ ratio close to 1. This is ideal. Zone 3 is when we completely deflate the alveoli and we only have the flow from the tap. Um, this is called a physiological shunt and it's a VQ ratio below 1. This is not ideal. Here's a diagram to illustrate the same concept. It's important to know about the zones of West because we can use this knowledge to artificially change zones of the lung. For example, zone 1 does not normally exist in healthy lung except a bit at the apices. But if you're overzealous with the ventilator, you can, art you can artificially inflate alveoli too much and create zone 1. The other way that zone 1 is normally created is in the case of hemorrhage, where the lung is underperfused and therefore the alveoli are overinflated relatively. Obviously the ideal is zone 2, we want to turn as much lung into zone 2 as possible and that's what we're doing with ventilators by opening up those alveoli. The other way to create more zone 2 is to prone the patients, that means switch them from supine to prone because then gravity will open up the alveoli and change zone 3 lung into zone 2 lung. However, turning the patient over like this is quite hard work and therefore should only be a senior decision but you'll often see patients in ICU prones like this. So we've seen that in order to maintain a good ventilation perfusion ratio, we need to keep our alveoli open just enough to let this happen. We need to keep them recruited. To understand how the body does this, we need to talk about functional residual capacity. So let's talk about the respiratory cycle. When you're breathing in and out normally, that's tidal volume. And that's about half a litre. If I breathe all the way in as much as I can, that's inspiratory reserve volume. And if I breathe out as much as I can, that's expiratory reserve volume. Then there's residual volume, which is the amount of air left in the lungs after maximal expiration, still participating in gas exchange, and it's therefore different from dead space. Dead space. It doesn't do anything, it's just air that stays there. And it's made out of two parts, the anatomical dead space, which is the bits of, of the bronchial tree not participating in gas exchange, i.e. the bronchioles and the bronchi. And it's also the alveolar dead space, which there isn't very much of, and it's basically zone one. Residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume equals the functional residual capacity. Functional residual capacity is very important for a number of reasons. First, it represents the point at which the elastic recoil force of the lung is equal to the elastic recoil force of the chest wall and it's therefore the resting state of the lung. Um, second, it's very representative of compliance. So if you increase the functional residual capacity, you'll also increase compliance. Compliance is a measure of the stiffness of the lungs. It's the change in volume for change in pressure. So if you have very fibrotic stiff lungs from interstitial lung disease, you'll have a reduced compliance. And if you have very stretchy emphysematous lungs from COPD, you will have an increased compliance. Third, the FRC actually represents the point of optimal compliance, the point at which it's the work of breathing is the least. Now, why do we care about FRC? Well, not just because of all those reasons, but because it's actually something we can change, which brings us on to CPAP. CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, and it's exactly the same thing as PEEP, Positive End Expiratory Pressure, and EPAP, Expiratory Positive Airway Pressure. They're all the same thing. Technically, CPAP is a mode of ventilation, and PEEP is a phase variable of ventilation but only ventilator pedants care about that. Everyone else just says they're the same thing. CPAP generally refers to the device which looks like this, 
for creating PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Normally we create this for ourselves by breathing against the partially closed glottis. When our airways are collapsing and we're not able to do that, then CPAP is a very good way to artificially increase the functional residual capacity by splinting open these collapsed alveoli. It's basically the equivalent of sticking your head out of a car window. You just have this constant flow of air into your lungs. The main indication for CPAP is type 1 respiratory failure. <gasps> We've not spoken about respiratory failures yet! Type 1 respiratory failure is hypoxemia without hypercapnia, and this is the result of usually ventilation perfusion mismatch or diffusion impairment. Type 2 respiratory failure is hypoxemia with hypercapnia, and this is almost always the result of a ventilatory failure. In other words, the patient can't breathe enough. Type 3 is basically another name for post-operative atelectasis, and type 4 is when you've got a decreased perfusion of the lungs due to shock. And yes, type 3 and 4 are basically versions of type 1 respiratory failure, but don't tell anyone. As I'm sure you know, the way you measure these blood gases is through an arterial blood gas. But, and this is a key principle, oxygenation does not tell you much about ventilation. And it's very easy for me to prove this. A pulse oximeter, a device for measuring the saturations of oxygen in my blood. And I appear to be peripherally shut down. Currently, my saturations are 98% on room air. But if I stop breathing completely, you can see it takes quite some time for my saturations to decrease. And the reason for that is you actually only need about one litre per minute of oxygen flow to your lungs to keep yourself well oxygenated. The thing that kicks oxygen out of the alveoli is when your CO2 starts increasing because then there's less space for the oxygen. So you can actually survive for quite some time without oxygen. This is common sense. Everybody knows that it's possible to hold one's breath without immediately dying. Even if it is common sense though, the reason I have to reiterate that oxygenation does not tell you much about ventilation is that people will often go, ah, SATs are fine, therefore the patient is fine, when actually the, that might not be true and they might be, able, they might be about to fall off a cliff. We need a number of indices to tell us about oxygenation and ventilation. First we have the alveolar to arterial oxygen gradient, then we have the respiratory index which is that divided by the PaO2 and then most importantly we have the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. So if you can think about that as what out of all the percentage of oxygen in the air, how much of that is ending up in your arterial blood? And it's therefore a good measure of shunting. We hence use this as a criterion for acute respiratory distress syndrome. 300 is mild ARDS, 200 moderate ARDS, and 100 severe ARDS. And finally, we have the oxygenation index, which is basically the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, but accounting for the airway pressure. Non-invasive ventilation is sometimes called BiPAP because that's the brand name for some of the devices. And it's basically like CPAP, except you've got some positive airway pressure on inspiration. You still have PEEP. So, so there's two numbers for NIV. The first number refers to the IPAP, the inspiratory positive airway pressure. And the second number refers to the EPAP, the expiratory positive airway pressure, which again is equivalent to PEEP. Now, you usually start patients on about 15 by 5. You eventually want to increase it as tolerated to about 20 by 5. Whenever you start a patient in an IV, you should consider it a trial and tell someone in intensive care because if the patient worsens, they're going to need intubating and ventilating. If the patient does indeed worsen and you do get in touch with intensive care again, then the first question they're going to ask you is, what is the mask fit like? Make sure before you call them that you've made sure that the mask is fitting properly and you can do that by checking for leaks. The leaks sound like high-pitched whistles and you can feel the air coming out around the mask. Most machines nowadays will actually just measure the leak for you. So that is my top tip for NIV. Make sure the mask fits. Main indications for NIV? Well, type 2 respiratory failures. For example, COPD. Heart failure is another good indication for NIV and even CPAP. It seems that the pressure pushes out the pulmonary edema from the airways and allows the patient to breathe better. However, it should be noted, do not try NIV 
in pneumonia because we know it increases mortality. It's probable that because the airways are all inflamed and uh, the surfactant is, has become a horrible proteinaceous exudate that it doesn't work as well. Ventilators, a massive topic that I can't cover the entirety of in one video, so I'll tell you the basics. If you want to control the oxygenation of the patient, you need to edit the PEEP or the FIOT. If you want to control the CO2 levels of your patient, you need to edit the IPAP, the inspiratory positive airway pressure, or the respiratory rate. And obviously the only way to edit a patient's respiratory rate is by intubating and ventilating them. Modes of ventilation. Every brand of ventilator seems to have its own way of describing things, but there are some constants. So here are the basic modes you can use. First of all, PSV, pressure support ventilation. This is where you let the patient drive their own respiratory rate, you let them breathe for themselves, but you help them along. You push some air into their lungs every time the machine detects that they're trying to breathe. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got CMV, continuous mandatory ventilation. And this is where you don't let the patient decide anything. You take complete control of their ventilation and you deliver a set number of breaths per minute. Halfway between the two is synchronous intermittent mandatory ventilation, SIMV. This is where you let the patients breathe themselves while you help them by pushing some air into their lungs if you detect that they're breathing. But again, you mandate a certain number of breaths per minute. And if the patient doesn't achieve that themselves, then you make them breathe. So that's the kind of more forgiving version of CMV, but still more controlled than PSV. Now you might be wondering why we bother with these different levels of control over a patient's ventilation. And the reason is, because at some point, we want to wean them off the ventilator. Remember, the longer they stay on a ventilator, the less likely they are to come off it. And that's because their chances of getting ventilator associated complications like pneumonia, tracheal stenosis, and tracheal atrophy increase. Different patients can be weaned at different rates. Some might tolerate a spontaneous breathing trial immediately, while others might need a prolonged period on the ventilator and therefore might benefit from a tracheostomy, which looks like this. Tracheostomies come in different types. You can have cuffed and uncuffed. A cuff is the balloon on the end, which stops air leak. And you can have fenestrated and unfenestrated, fenestrations being little gaps in the tube, which can allow speech. Now, weaning isn't an exact science, and there can be lots of problems with it. For example, over sedation, respiratory depression, and deconditioning. Yeah, just like any other muscle in the body, if you don't use the respiratory muscles for a long time, they'll start to atrophy and need to be built up. And that's why the weaning approach is necessary. That's all from me now, but if you're interested, I'll leave some reading material for you in the video description. And of course, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comment section and I shall get back to you. Thanks for watching.